Okay. So thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I think that this is a fantastic conference. We've seen many different uh, technologies being used for science education and specifically for chemistry. <coughs> So I'd like to actually show you in, in detail how it is that I've been using Second Life uh, to teach chemistry. Now before I do that, I always like to remind the audience that you know, there is a purpose to these things. And as we get new technologies, we, you know, as we evaluate these new technologies, we have to remember that we're still teachers and there are things that we're trying to do with them, right? And it, in terms of chemistry, I want to have students who are competent to understand and generate new, new chemistry. So keep that in mind whenever you look at, the, at these different uh, applications. So the story starts actually a little bit before, I'm going to talk about Second Life, but I think it's really important to show how it actually evolved to that. A couple of years ago, I started to record my lectures. As I am now, actually, this talk will be made available. Uh, I do this in the form of a screencast, so everything that appears on the screen in addition to my voice gets recorded. And I would give that to my students you know, after the, the, the class so that they could review material. And you know, I could put these on iTunes or I could put them on a server. There are many, many different ways. We've heard about podcasting, so that's one way that you can deliver this, this, this content. And you can see from this smaller image, I use a tablet PC, so I draw molecules. And in organic chemistry, it's especially important to not just see the final answer, but see how you arrive to that final answer, how you push the arrows and all of that. And so what happened is I started to track the attendance of my class as I made these available. And you can see here this yellow line is the attendance from the first day of class until the end. And the same thing with in, the, in this class, you know, starts off here and ends up. So by the last lecture, there's only you know 10 to 20 percent of students that are actually still showing up. Now, what's interesting about that is that I looked at the performance in both these classes between those two groups of students, and the performance was the same. So in other words, if they just watched my lectures and never came to class, they did just as well as the you know the small minority of students who, who who still came. And so I started to rethink about what, what does it mean for me to be a teacher and does it necessarily mean for me to repeat myself uh, you know, term after term, the, exactly the same material. We have a lot of stuff to go through and, you know, and if I am going to be lecturing, I, I, you know, there's only a certain amount of time that I have left to do other things. So I started to just actually assign the recorded lectures and I started to do other things with my class time. So, for a couple of terms now, I've been basically using the class time as workshops. And the kinds of things that we do here is a lot of what we you know, saw here today in terms of games, uh, in terms of Second Life. You have students who are watching the lectures with headphones and then when they come to a problem that they're having difficulty with, they come up and join the group. Uh, it's either one-on-one -on -one attention or if there are several students, it may be group work. Whatever it is, I'm spending the same amount of time teaching, but I'm doing something completely different. I'm actually being a learning catalyst as opposed to a parakeet. And I think that it actually, it's, it's better for the students, I think. And the other thing that's really uh, useful about having these workshops, and don't, uh, don't underestimate this, the, the, the technical implementation for these software packages. Uh, don't believe that all the students are already you know, on YouTube, that they already know how to use Second Life. In my experience, that's not true. It's actually pretty unusual that a student will already have been in Second Life. And it requires me to show them how to create an account and how to get on. And there's all kinds of issues with that. For example, a lot of students, their, their computers don't have a good enough video card, so their experience is quite poor in Second Life. And they think, you know, why is everybody going on this thing? It's because it's so, it's so lousy. It's just simply, you know, they don't know what to expect. So having the face-to-face the, the -face workshop is extremely useful for just taking five, 10 minutes and helping them create an account. Okay, so I'm gonna show a couple of different technologies. Uh, last year I talked in much more detail about this. So I'm just gonna sort of gloss over it. I have used blogging. Um, so my students, you know, would write something about IMI information, for example, and they would write a blog and they would upload pictures. And each one of these technologies has its advantages and disadvantages, and I'm going to try to point those out as I go through. The advantage of a blog is that it's really easy to, to create one, especially with, with Blogger. And so it's, it, does, it doesn't take that much time for me to, to set it up. The disadvantage is that when the student corrects their mistakes, there's no, there's no track of that. So I can't actually 
you know, follow how they've actually arrived at the, at the final presentation. So it has some uses, it's very simple. But if I'm going to be doing student assignments and I want to, I want to basically see that, that, that interchange between me and the student or between the student and other students, I will probably want to use a wiki. And so a wiki is again very simple to set up. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated for the student to edit, but really not that much more. Um, and again, it has the advantages that I can look at the, at the different versions. And here's an example of a, of a wiki project where a student went into my lab notebook. I have an open laboratory notebook. I, I do uh, anti-malarial uh, research, so we make compounds, synthetic organic group. And she went and looked at actual NMR spectra of an ongoing project. And you know, this is an NMR. It's not really that important to go into details, but in, in, in the class material, this would have been predicted to be a, 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 a single peak. But it turns out when you blow it up, it's actually a triplet. And that's something that I learned, actually, from you know, looking at these things more, more, more closely. And this is the kind of thing where the student is learning something, the teacher is learning something, the graduate students doing the work are learning something. And by using a wiki, you know, everyone can actually watch that uh, in, in real time. Some of the other things that I've done using tablet PCs, uh, this game here I call Wheel of Orgo, where you put a starting material, like benzene in this case, and put a final product. And the students would take turns trying to come up with either a step from the starting material to anything, any, any reaction that we, that we uh, saw in class, or try to write a step that goes towards the product. And the idea was to connect one of the trees with the other tree. And so you know, students would get a point for having the right reagents, for example, student might get three points for completing the synthesis. And I found this to be actually very useful for organic synthesis. The difficulty with this is that a lot of students are shy. So it is actually a big deal for some students to come up right on the tablet PC. So all of these have pluses and minuses. And that would be the minus you know, when it comes to this. But it was certainly very effective for students who uh, didn't have a problem with it. All right, so now we're going to move towards the world of you know, more classical games. Uh, how many of you have heard of Unreal Tournament? Okay, it's a first person shooter, kind of like Halo. I mean, there's a lot of these games where you walk around in a virtual world and you can actually get a version that doesn't have any weapons and there's a, a commercial version that actually has it. I used more extensively the version that didn't have any weapons. It was free, it was easy for the students to, to download it. And it would basically consist of these rooms where there would be pictures of some chemical concept. So here we're looking at a hybridization plus a Lewis structure. Here we're looking at chirality with a Fisher projection. And there's actually four walls here and three of the images are incorrect somehow. And only one of the images is correct. So what I would have the students do is do a race in that if you went through a door that was correct, you ended up in the second room and then as long as you, 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 you kept picking the right answers, you would, you would keep progressing through the maze. If you got any of them wrong, you had to start over. And so it was a, it, it was a pretty easy way for me to do races, that's not, you know, actually a game. I didn't give out any points for this, uh, but I did give out prizes like a molecular model kit or something like that. So there was definitely a motivation for the students to do it. Um, I thought this went pretty well. Sometimes we actually did it with the weapons. And, uh, this was with a commercial game, but it was all the same content. So I could reuse all of these images and just put them in a different context. In the weapons version, the idea you know, is to survive, right? So if you, uh, if you get through a correct uh, door, you might get some more ammunition or health or something like that. So you know, it was another way of, of engaging. Again, pluses and minuses. You may not want to have weapons <laughs> in your games. But some students do find that more engaging. Now, I would probably still be using Unreal Term or some sort of you know, game like that if, if I didn't come across Second Life. Uh, but Second Life has a, you know, a whole other dimension that hopefully I'll give you a taste of here today in my, my, in my talk. But it turns out that you can do exactly the same kind of game, but instead of having rooms that you move through, we created these little obelisks. So, by the way, this is you know, the, the, the shot of Second Life, the avatar here, that's going to be me. So whenever there's a picture, you see the back of the head, that's, that's me moving through the world. When you click on these obelisks, again, four images pop up. 
and three of them are incorrect, one of them is, is correct. And here, instead of going to another room, you just get another set of questions. So I do the same thing, I still do races, and I still give out you know, prizes like that. And I think it, you know, it works pretty well, but the advantage is that students can come from around the world at any time, and they can actually take the same quizzes, and they can interact with my students. So for me, for Second Life, the huge advantage of it is really this ability to network. And I want my students to network with uh, you know, educators, other students. And what you'll find in Second Life is that the, the content on the island is what governs the type of person that visits it. So it's like a chat room. I mean, basically, if you're on Na Nature Island or you're on Drexel Island or any kind of educational island like that, we really haven't had any negative experiences. But if you go out in the, you know, the real world, there's all kinds of things out there, and you have to be you know, aware of that. So that's how I started with uh, Second Life. After a while, I actually met people that I started to collaborate with. Uh, Andrew Lang is, is you know, a very close collaborator, and we've done a lot of stuff together. I'll put his name up you know, on, on, on relevant slides here. Uh, and you know, that, that's a perfect example of why, as an educator, you'd want to use Second Life. And it's actually not so much you know, teaching the students. It's just tapping into this huge reservoir of very intelligent people who are very skilled at doing things. Andy is very skilled at uh, writing script or making buildings in, in, in Second Life. And, so, and, and he's a mathematician. So when we come together, I have my chemical knowledge. And we couple that to his, you know, his skill in terms of uh, rendering objects. And we can do some things that you know, we can be comfortable that are actually uh, scientifically accurate. Here's an example of a student project that was done in Second Life. And so here, there's a camphor. The student is actually trying to show the concept of chirality using camphor because it's a particularly difficult molecule to visualize in 2D. And this is the size of the uh, avatar here. So you can see that the molecules are actually much bigger than the avatars. So this is a completely different way of interacting with molecules. Normally, if you make a, a molecule set, you, you hold it in your hand or you draw it on a piece of paper. And here you can actually go all around it, you can sit on it, you can do all kinds of things that you can't otherwise do. And it's very interesting to see you know, learning chemical concepts this way. Now the reason that this is possible is because with Andy, we managed to create resors that don't require any computing skill whatsoever. All right? So in terms of uh, doing stuff on Second Life, what's becoming exciting now is not so much the stuff that you can do, it's how easy it is to do it. <coughs> With very minimal training, you, anyone can actually make these molecules. And I'll, I'll show you that uh, in a little bit here. So students can have fun with this. You can actually uh, sit on the molecule and fly around with it. So you can you know, try to simulate docking. There's so many things that you can do that you know, if, you, if you let students play with it. And you have a, a buckyball here, which is pretty popular. So in terms of how do you actually teach students to do this, um, well, I don't want to be sitting there showing them how to code. I mean, it's a chemistry class. It should be about you know, organic chemistry. So what we've done is Andy's basically written these scripts that will take as an input smiles, inchies, or inchy keys, and will actually hit a bunch of web services, one in Indiana, one in North Carolina, will actually do a minimization so that the molecule has a realistic shape, and then will actually build the molecule in 3D right in front of you. So as a student, and more, more importantly as a teacher, I only have to teach students how to find the smiles code. And luckily, there are some great services out there, like ChemSpider. Uh, the students simply typed in camphor in the search box, and camphor pops up, and here's the smiles. Do uh, copy it, paste it into Second Life, and it just pops up. So it becomes quite feasible then to have students doing projects at a pretty high level of sophistication, because it, it doesn't require a lot of my time. Some other things that we've done more recently is trying to correlate molecules with NMR spectra. So again, this molecule here, acetophenone, this was created using that same resor. Just the student found the SMILES code, dumped it in, and they created it. And here's the NMR spectrum, and then the student explains you know, how each proton corresponds to, to each peak in the, in, in the spectrum. Now, this particular spectrum is just an image. So the student you know, went on, on the web, took a, a picture of an NMR, and then put it in Second Life. 
What we've managed to do quite recently, actually just a few days ago, is actually interact with the spectrum. So this is an, an NMR spectrum, and I can actually talk to it, and I can tell it to zoom to between 2.1 and 2.3 ppm, and the spectrum will actually respond, it will zoom to any region. So again, this is very simple, right? I mean, to interact with it, you just gotta type in the chat box. And I think this is gonna make it very easy to bring a whole bunch of people together, students, teachers, whatever, and be able to discuss pretty sophisticated chemical concepts. If we wanna look at an NMR, we can just pull it up and we can just zoom in and, and talk about it. So a few other things that uh, we've been able to do in Second Life. Uh, we've been able to demonstrate docking. So as I, I think I mentioned, uh, my lab focuses on making anti-malarial compounds. And this is one of those compounds that we've made. And this here is actually the receptor site of uh, enoil reductase. That's a malarial enzyme that we've been trying to inhibit. And this is set up in such a way that if you click on the molecule, you will see it drift down and connect into the receptor site. Okay, so this is actually, you're there and you're watching this thing in 3D come down. And there's actually four hydrogen bonding points. And it turns out that it's actually really tricky to see that. And this is a very interesting way to understand what does it mean when you have a drug molecule interacting with an enzyme. Okay, it's just another way to do it. It doesn't replace the paper, it doesn't replace all the other software programs, but it's one more way of visualizing it. There's all kinds of, of things that you could do in terms of chemistry. You can display uh, the entire enzyme, uh, and this, this Peter Miller has done quite a bit of work. This, this is the same enzyme, it's just, you know, it's the whole thing instead of just the receptor site. And again, recently uh, with Andy Lang, we can actually go from a file in, in PDB and actually go to a fully rendered protein using up only one prim in Second Life. If you're not familiar with Second Life, everything comes down to prims. Prims, you, you only get so many of them per island. So right now, Drexel Island is about 90% saturated. So we couldn't actually do a massive project because there's not enough prims. This here is the 3D structure of Avidin, and it only uh, took one prim to make that. So you can imagine you, you could have much larger projects than you could with the other uh, way of rendering. So this thing is very detailed and it uses up a lot of prims. So again, I don't have to know how to code in Second Life. All I have to do is show my students, this is where you get PDB files, this is what you use to make this, and then you know, have them go and actually do their projects. Some other things that we've done, um, we can actually show reactions taking place. So this is a reaction between an aldehyde and an amine to make an imine. And there are actually three steps, at least with this mechanism. And you can see here, this is the, uh, the blue nitrogen, and here's the carbonyl. And you actually talk to these molecules. You say next, next, or back, and it will actually go to the next intermediate. Now, what's special about that is that each intermediate has actually been minimized so that it's, it's realistic. It has a realistic shape which is something that you don't often get when you look at these reactions on paper. On paper, everything is, is flat, all right? And, but actually, these intermediates are not flat at all. They're twisted, the hybridization changes, so there's tremendous changes in the angle, and that's something that you, know, you get a really good feeling for when you're in Second Life doing it. So we're accumulating this information, and right now, there's not a search engine that will actually go into objects in Second Life in, in the way that you might think Google would do it. So one of the things that I've set up is the Second Life Molecules Wiki, where you know if we do create new molecules, we can just create a new page. Those pages will be indexed by Google. And so if someone's searching for you know, this particular molecule, they will find this page, and then there will be a link. that are called slurls, Second Life URLs, where people could cl click on it and end up at that specific location in, in, in Second Life. So this is another, another way, very simple thing to do, but very effective in terms of indexing. Again, with Andy, um, we've made a 3D periodic table. So each one of these um, atoms, if you click on them, it will actually show you more information about each element. And this is you know, freely available. It's on uh, American Chemical Society Island, if any of you want to see that. 
We can also have offices. So this is how I'd like to look in real life, but I can't. So I have to do that as an avatar. But here's a picture of myself. And this is an area where you can meet students or you know, if students are visiting and want to find out more about Drexel Chemistry Department, you know, they, can, they can look it up. I can put information about my lab. So here are pictures of my students, pictures of our equipment, chemicals, things like that. And something that works very well in Second Life are posters. So there are posters on uh, Nature's Island. Uh, Na the Nature Publishing Group has, a, has actually three islands, and they're called Second Nature. And there's these areas that have a whole bunch of posters. And in this particular area, this is an example of someone that I met. I think she's from the Netherlands, and she works on Crohn's disease. And we met in Second Life. She, you know, I found out she was going to a conference. And you know she was interested in, pr in putting her poster here. And so this is actually a whole PowerPoint presentation. If you click on it, it will walk you through the entire presentation. And there's a little bell here that you can click it, and it will summon the presenter. So if she's in Second Life, you know, she'll get an, an instant message saying, come on over. If she's not in Second Life, she'll get an email. And then if, if it's convenient, she can actually go in. And I've actually met quite a few people that way from these bells. In fact, the posters are so effective that we've actually run entire conferences using them. On, on Second Nature, there's actually a whole area called Saifu Lives On, which is an extension of the Saifu conference that happens every summer um, over at Google. And basically, this is an example of what happens at a conference. We put up posters, and the speaker will go up and talk. You can use voice in Second Life, or you can chat. The advantage of chatting is that you, know, you can get a transcript really easily. So we generally have used more of the chat than the voice, but people have done either. And then you basically get to meet all these people. So these are all people who are interested in whatever topic that you happen to be talking about. And in this particular case, this is about open science. It's about new ways of doing science. And so those are the people precisely that I want to meet. Okay, So again, that networking concept in Second Life. So because this is uh, Chemical Heritage Foundation, I'm, I'm going to focus you know, more on the chemistry. There's a lot of other stuff in terms of biology. There's genome islands, all kinds of things that are wonderful. But in terms of chemistry, I'd just like to point to you to this, this recent project that I was a part of. Uh, that uh, Kate Seller at the American Chemical Society spearheaded over there uh, to get an actual island for ACS. And maybe you guys will be next, right? And this island actually has the shape of their, the, the Phoenix uh, icon, all right? So this, this, this stuff here in green is land, and the, uh, the blue here is uh, water. And I'll just give you a few screenshots. If you're interested, you can contact me. You know, I can show you how to, how to get to all these. There's a, actually a headquarters building where you can download some free stuff. You can get uh, that, this reser that'll let you make molecules that I have my students use. Well, that actually, you can get a copy of it right here in the ACS headquarters. Very convenient. There's a section, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this ACS landmarks program. American Chemical Society, I get, you know, maybe one or two per year, pick parts of chemistry that are particularly important, like you know, purification of aluminum or chemical abstracts. And so there's this little museum area where those landmarks are located. And if you click on, on, the, on these obelisks, uh, it will go to the web and you know, give you more information about these. So that's another part. And for the first time, you know, and I, I helped them out with this, with actually having a poster area for the Cymix session. If you've ever been to an American Chemical Society meeting, there's a Cymix where it's a very group of people, and they give posters. And 20 people out of that group uh, agreed to put their poster on Second Life. And so there's this whole area where all these posters are still there and will still be there for, for several months to come. And some of them have online indicators. So you can see if the presenter's online. And so again, it's that whole fostering, that, that, that uh, networking. And what we tried to do for this is if there was a, some molecule that was particularly interesting, we would you know, put it next to the poster. So that you know, it's not just a question of replicating what you can do in real life, but to do things that you know, are, are quite specific to this, this new <coughs> technology. Some fun things too. Um, 
So it is kind of nice to be able to see a nanotube in 3D, right? You can go in the middle of it, you can see what it actually looks like. And then there's some you know, interesting things like this molecule here is called phellocene. It actually looks like a cat. And that, you know, it was part of this talk from uh, CAS that basically they were picking interesting molecules or interesting findings from their database. And so I thought this was a perfect molecule to represent, you know, this collection of molecules. So you can not only put the molecule, but you can add eyes. There's all kinds of things you can do. The ACS also has a resident chemist program. And what that means is that there are areas that are dedicated. If you have a chemistry lab and would like to share what you're doing, you know, you can go on this platform and you, and you can put different things. The Hinostroza lab, for example, has uh, posters that they've given at various talks. Gus Rosania has a pretty interesting uh, area. He actually does a lot of uh, fluorescence microscopy. And he has lots and lots of these little images in a cube. So you're in the middle of this cube. And you can actually try to see patterns in the data. So it's, for him, it's a way to visualize his lab information in a way that he simply can't do you know, in real life. And if any of you are, are interested, uh, there'll be a little party going on uh, at 1.30 on May 6th at, at the uh, Geodesic Dome at the American Chemical Society. Uh, that it's always nice to, to pick a time and place to meet people because oftentimes you know, you're interested in, in the island, you go there, there's maybe one person there, or there's nobody there, and you don't get to interact. So sometimes you know, we can set a time, a specific time, and if anyone's interested in that, let me know. I'll make sure that you're set up and uh, you can explore it. And really, that's, that pretty much covers what I wanted to say. Um, in terms of what technology to use, you know, I get uh, these, these emails from my friends. You know, sometimes you get these uh, articles that say, e-learning doesn't work, you know, like a big conclusion. Or a second life can't be used for education. And, you know, it's, it's pretty annoying because it, it cannot be boiled down to that. It all depends on the details of how you use it. So if you're using Second Life and, I don't know, you want to record hour-long lectures and you want to display them, it's not going to work well. But if you want to have a poster or if you want to have students make 3D molecules, well, now we can do that. We couldn't do that easily a year ago, but now we can really do that easily. So it all depends on what you're trying to do. And I would recommend it, the easiest way to do it is find someone who's already doing something close to what you're interested in and have them bring you into the world. Have them show you how to do it simply. A big mistake, if people want to learn about Second Life, they just dive in and you end up on this place called Orientation Island, which is kind of like a purgatory. <laughs> and you can't, you can't leave. They, 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 they sort of rig it so that you have to go through certain tasks. I understand the concept, but the reality is most people just get really annoyed and you know, it takes them two hours to finish it. And you don't really need that. I mean, for our purposes, I want students to be able to fly around, to walk, to teleport, and to chat. So that takes you know, two minutes to show someone how to do that. Yeah, you can learn how to write code and all these kinds of things, but it's really not necessary for the kind of applications that we're doing. So, you know, again, if, you, if you're interested in this, talk to somebody uh, who's already doing it. And you can use things like wikis and blogs, um, you know, to interact with students. And the Second Life really, yes, there are some specific chemical things that I showed, but I can't overemphasize this. The major benefit of Second Life is the networking. If I have a student who does a project on Second Life, Fine, so they, you know, they learn how a molecule looks in 3D, that's great. But if they get to meet someone you know, for their next co-op, or they get to meet someone that's gonna hire them someday, or they get to make a friend you know, that's also a chemist, that actually is the greatest reward. And that's something that you will not find on you know, sites that are closed in. There are other sites that you know, have a virtual world, but you know, there's not a lot of interaction. Second Life on average has like 50,000 people on it at any given point in time. So the odds are you're going to find someone, you know, pretty quickly that uh, you can that's that's like-minded, that you guys have the same uh, objectives. And the other thing that I've done here to ensure my success is I have not made this mandatory. So that's another big big difference. This is not for everyone. I mean, some students definitely get it and they enjoy it, but typically I only have maybe 10% of students who do the races, for example. 
And, you know, I use multiple channels. I'm a big believer in this. So I, don't, I care if you've learned the material. And yeah, I use, you know, quizzes. I use tests, objective tests to, to make sure that, you know, students know stuff. But I don't really care if you use the screencasts or if you meet me at the workshop or if you, you know, you're in Second Life or if you're in Second Life next to me or you're in Second Life in the dorm. I'm not concerned with that. I mean, do what makes sense for you. And if you do that, you should do okay in my class. If you don't, you know, you probably won't. But it's not mandatory, and I don't think it is applicable to all students. So if you do these things, you know, as on a voluntary basis, I think that you'll find the experience to be pleasant, and it's not going to be a big stress. Because the worst thing that'll happen, you know, if it's not for points, if it's not for grades, uh, it may just not work, but it's not gonna have, you know, very many consequences. So I would just, you know, suggest uh, starting slowly. And uh, yeah, so everything I've talked about here is essentially free. In Second Life, you do, you know, we bought an island. Drexel has bought an entire island. The American Chemical Society has an entire island. But if you just want to play around, there are plenty of places that will let you, you know, give you a little area for educators and will let you experiment. I, that's how I started. I started on uh, Nature Island. They invited scientists to participate. And I thought, why not, you know, T test it out one term with my students and I you know started to use these quiz objects and you know it worked out and we eventually got an island but to get started you don't need an entire island you can actually just start um, with some friends and uh, have them have have them put up some stuff that you'd like to see and I guess that's it